Extremely honored uh, to introduce our keynote speaker, the Honorable Cruz Reynoso, this evening. Uh, in light of today's theme, the 75th anniversary of the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II, and as um, uh, Carol referred to, it is also today is the day also in which the Chinese Exclusion Act was enacted in 1882. Born in Brea, California, he and his family relocated to the barrios of La Habra when he was seven years old. His parents were farm laborers, and he made it clear they weren't migrant workers. Uh, they worked in the orange groves of Orange County. However, during the summer months, the family would obtain farm work in Central California, picking plums and grapes, the grapes that they used for raisins. Uh, initially, he attended a segregated elementary school. And when he entered the fourth grade, he was surprised to see that his teacher was a Latino. And that was the only Latino he would see throughout his uh, education from elementary school to law school. And at that point, he aspired to be a teacher. His sense of justice and equality arose while reciting the Pledge of Allegiance and singing patriotic songs while in elementary school. They told of a country that professed liberty, justice, and brotherhood. He had strong beliefs in those words and still has strong beliefs today in those words. Although some sources indicated his fight for justice began while with the California Rural Legal Assistance, it actually occurred much earlier. When he was in seventh uh, or eighth grade, he noticed a postal carrier delivering mail to a white family. He wondered why his community was not getting such treatment. The house in question was only separated by two city blocks of orange groves uh, from his residence in the Barrios. In his neighborhood, everyone had to walk to the post office, which was a mile away, to retrieve their mail. He went to the local post office and asked why a postal carrier was not delivering mail to his house or to their neighborhood. The postal supervisor responded that she did not know because it was, quote, out of her hands. He then inquired as to who he had control over the matter. She answered the Postmaster General in Washington, D.C. He got the Postmaster General's address, gathered a petition from his community, and attached it to a complaint to the Postmaster General. Several months elapsed, and he received a letter that was postmarked from Washington, D.C. The Postmaster General informed him that he would investigate the matter. Shortly thereafter, the Reynoso family and their community began having their mail delivered by a postal carrier. After that, the local post office supervisor gave him the cold shoulder whenever he entered that post office. <laughs> the young Cruz Reynoso saw a wrong that needed to be corrected and did something about it. When he got his first car, he was driving down his community and saw and confronted, well rather I should say that he saw two of his friends who were standing outside a dance hall. When he asked them, what are you doing out here, they responded that they won't let Latinos into this dance. Well, this was another thing that needed to be corrected. He confronted the sponsors of that dance and he used as an argument that his school, as well as other schools in the area, were now integrated, that they're old-fashioned, that, you know, that discrimination is wrong. And after that, he never saw his friends having to stand outside that dance hall again. Although he first wanted to be a teacher, as I indicated, but he also wanted to be an artist. But even after that, he found himself asking the question, what profession can I choose that will allow me to fight injustice and inequality and keep our Constitution faithful to its words? And the answer was the field of law. He then went on to graduate from both, uh, UC Berkeley's School of Law. And he was true to his word. He actually opened up a, a small private practice in El Centro where he would be able to serve the community there. He then took a leave of absence went to work for the Division of Fair Employment and the Equal Opportunity Commission. He finally left his practice to become the director of California Rural Legal Assistance, which was one of the most rewarding times of, of his legal career, uh, in which he imparted to me uh, uh, over lunch. He also taught at the University of Mexico School of Law, 
and was the first Hispanic to do so. His career as a jurist began when he was appointed Associate Justice of the Third District of Appeals, uh, I should say the California Third District of Appeals in 1976. It was during this time that he swore in a much younger me as an attorney. He encouraged us new attorneys to advocate against injustices, especially against minorities, women, the poor, immigrants, etc. I have never forgotten that speech. He was later elevated as Associate Justice of the California Supreme Court in 1982. He is now Professor Emeritus at the University of California at Davis School of Law. Due to time constraints, I will only mention a few of many awards, uh, which include the Presidential Medal of Freedom that he received from President Clinton, the Hispanic Heritage Foundation Award in Education, and the Alice and Clifford Prize in Social uh, Justice, Diplomacy, and Tolerance. He also continues to be active with the National Coalition of Organization as its president, La Raza Le Lawyers Association, Mexican American Bar Association, the California Judge Association, and the American Bar Association. So without further ado, please give it up to our keynote speaker, Professor Emeritus and Associate Justice of the California Supreme Court, the Honorable Cruz Reynoso. right? Can you hear me? Ah, good. Uh, thank you very much. Well, as you've heard in the introduction, uh, I've been a troublemaker all my life. Uh, but uh, today we are not celebrating but remembering uh, the 75th anniversary of the Executive Order 9066. Um, we remember it so that we can make sure that we are protecting the constitutional rights of every American. That executive order uh, was, was, was issued, uh, of course, during the Second World War. On December 7, 1941, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, when, when Pearl Harbor was, was attacked, called it a day that will live in infamy. I suggest to you that to the Japanese Americans, the day that would live in infamy is actually February 19, 1942, when that executive order 9066 was, was signed and 120,000 Japanese Americans were imprisoned thereby. The spirit of what that means was captured in an op-ed piece that I that I read recently by actor George Takai, who wrote in part as follows, and I want to read it to you because I think it captures, it captures the moment. He wrote, every day since the late 1960s, on the last Saturday of April, there has been a pilgrimage to a place called Manzanar in California, where, where one of, of 10 United States internment camps once stood. The annual journeys began as a way to remember those Japanese Americans who were incarcerated during World War II and to begin as a way to mark a dark chapter in our history. The pilgrimage includes elderly original internees and their families, as well as neighbors of the site, school children, and since September 11, American Muslims, who see parallels between what once happened and today. And then he added on a personal note, I was five years old at the beginning of the internment in Arkansas. I remember every school morning reciting the Pledge of Allegiance 
my eyes upon the stars and stripes of the flag, but at the same time, I could see from the window the barbed wire and the sentry towers where guards kept guns trained on us. So he's expressing the conflict that was going on at that time of him as a young person, a young boy, five years old, uh, being patriotic and looking at the flag and yet looking uh, at the fact that they were behind barbed wires. The, it is, <clears throat> excuse me, too often, it seems to me, in times of crises, Americans too often abandon the constitutional protections that we all have. During the Depression, for example, there was a, an action called repatriation, and that preceded, obviously, the Second World War, and I'll speak to that in, in a minute. Um, and and I, did, I didn't realize that uh, a gentleman had written the history of the high school that I attended, Fullerton Union High School in Orange County. Uh, and and in, in that book, he quoted quite extensively from a lady who had been involved in an Americanization program. And uh, she went to all of the Vasios in Orange County. I, uh, myself lived in a barrio called Alta Vista. I used to say that the poor, the barrio, the fancier the name. The only, the only barrio that I knew that was poorer was near Los Angeles. It was called Maravilla, marvelous. So, so, so she went to the, those camps to 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 teach uh, many of the immigrant women uh, how to cook uh, uh, American food and to teach to teach English. Uh, and. And, and, sh and she wrote about what happened during the Depression, where she said that many of the Anglo-Americans used to refer to the Mexicans as our Mexicans. But then when the Depression came, and a scapegoat was, was sought, obviously, because of the Depression, they, they started referring to them as those Mexicans. So it seems to me that that's, in some ways, a key to what's going on. If we consider a fellow human being ours, then they're okay. If we consider them those, they're not okay. So that's something that we have to, I think, uh, continue to be conscious of. Dur during the repatriation, uh, about a million Mexican and Mexican Americans were deported to to Mexico. I looked up. I looked up the the, the population at that time. In 1930, there were only about two million. Uh, Latinos living in the United States, so that means that about 50% were, quote, repo repatriated. The only problem was that most of those who were repatriated were American citizens. It's hard to repatriate somebody who's not from that country. Uh, in fact, that's exactly what happened with my own family. Uh, my family ended up in Mexico during the Depression. They had three children. I, I was the baby at that time. So, so three of the five who were, quote, repatriated, end quote, were in fact Amer American citizens. And in, 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 in likewise, uh, during the Second World War, during the Japanese internment, where we had Japanese Americans, and on this occasion, practically all of them, 120,000, uh, were were sent to concentration concentration camps, and and one of them, Karamatsu, appealed appealed the case. Incidentally, Karamatsu, it's, uh, I read his biography. It was interesting that he uh, refused to a concentration camp, uh, as as all his family did, and his family was rather ashamed of him because he he hadn't obeyed the order to go to a concentration camp. But he really just wanted to stay with his girlfriend. <laughs> so it was a very personal decision uh, on, on his part. Nonetheless, he came to represent some, some of the issues that came up during the Second World War because his case was the only one that went to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and in fact, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, uh, ruled that it was not improper for the government to arrest him. Later on, a hearing took place before a federal judge uh, uh, by lawyers who brought the case uh, for Karamatsu, where that, where that federal judge ruled uh, that, in fact, uh, he had been incarcerated improperly. But the interesting thing is that the U.S. Supreme Court ruling has not been changed 
So I think we have to have still today a sense of concern that the that the U.S. Supreme Court opinion that said that that imprisoning uh, Karamasu was in fact legal. So so it seems to me that we have we have to continue to be concerned about some of the, some of those issues. You've heard tonight about the uh, the Jap not the Japanese the the, the Latino J uh, Japanese who were brought. Uh, to this country, uh, some, something like 2.2, 2, uh, correction, 2,264 Japanese Latin Americans were brought to this country. Uh, apparently the feeling was that any Japanese American uh, or J Japanese could, could be disloyal to, the, to, to this country. They were brought, brought here from 13 different Latin American countries. Uh, interestingly, once they were here uh, at the end of the war, they, they, they were declared to be illegal aliens. Uh, so so th they had to be they had to leave leave the country even if they wanted wanted to stay uh, in, 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 in this in this country. Now, uh, I, I read purposefully the op-ed piece uh, a minute ago because it mentions Muslims. Uh, and, and why, did, why did George Sakai mention Muslims? I think he did so because, because we've seen a lot of discrimination on the basis of race and, and ethnicity. Ethnicity in terms of Mexican Americans, race mostly in terms of Japanese Americans. But now he, men he mentions Muslims because now we, we, we have the potential for sim similar discrimination on the, ba on the basis of, re of religion. And, uh, and I guess, to me, uh, it, it, it creates a yet more serious problem to we, that we ought to think about. Because when I was preparing, preparing th this talk, I was, I was just going to say that the issues that come up normally come up at a time of crisis, the depression, the war. The reality is, that in terms of the Muslims, we don't have a crisis. It's a crisis made by the White House of the United States of America. That's who made the crisis. And yet, as he points out, there is the same danger. So it's not just during during a depression or or during or during uh, a war that we as Americans have to worry about protecting the basic civil rights of every American. It's the it's the reality that we have to. We have to be concerned to protect those rights every day, every night, every week, every month, every year. I often, I often think of Abraham Lincoln, who, when the, when the Civil War was about to begin, he mentioned that it was true that at that time the Constitution permitted slavery. But he said that the Constitution also included what he called the standard maxim of the Constitution, the standard maxim of freedom and equality. And he did that at a time of great crisis in our country, saying that nonetheless, we have to live, live, live by that standard maxim. We, may, we have, hopefully, <laughs> we are not now in, about to get into a civil war uh, among the states. But there are still dangers, as we have, as, as uh, actor Takai has mentioned, with respect to, to, to Muslims. We still have dangers of, di of, of discrimination. Uh, had, I had a meeting uh, not long ago with a gentleman and his daughter, and we were talking about discrimination against African Americans. And the gentleman who was older was asking, why can we, why can, why can we still have that? After after the civil rights movement and all and, and and all the progress that we've made, and we have made a great deal of progress. You know, I tell people that I'm proud to be an American, but that doesn't mean that I have to ignore the things that happened in our history that that haven't lived up to to, to, to our, our to our ideals. And so so in thinking about Abraham Lincoln uh, and that crisis, and he said that we still have have to look at the Constitution and the standard maxim of freedom and equality. That's the standard, it seems to me, that we all have to live by. Thank you very much.